factories in what was essentially or what's was good YouTube flash speaks back another video decided to take an early lunch man some things to rap about um shout out to Colorado Buffaloes uh Deion Sanders uh Arguably the greatest football player to ever play. In my opinion, the second greatest cornerback to ever play in the NFL. But if I put together a starting team, he'd be on the team. Um, he'd, be, he'd be one of my corners. He'd be my right cornerback. Another guy who is number one will be my left cornerback. Um, when I put out my all-time NFL team, I will reveal who that starting cornerback is. The guy that I will put on the left side. To go along with Dion. At any rate, uh, I like the improvements on the Colorado's offense. Um, at number five, that wide receiver Horn Jr. Man, he's a real deal. It reminds me of a Bama receiver or an SEC guy. Speed, hands, uh, quickness. You know, uh, after the catch, what he's able to do, boy's going to be trouble. Hunter, of course. Uh, made a couple very, very good plays. You know, what I what I want to see, though, man, I think I would advise that Hunter be used a little bit less on the offense and work primarily on corner and kind of be used spottily. You know what I mean? Kind of like how Dion was. Like when Dion, he played both ways, but he wasn't out there for as many snaps as, you know, the way he used Hunter. And, you know, and I wonder, did this have anything to do with why he wasn't able to make it through the season last uh, last year, you know. Um, but whatever the case may be, man, shout out for, to them. Um, they didn't have the best defensive performance. And um, I'm going to give it a few more games before I, uh, you know, give a whole ruling on the defense. Um, I didn't like, the you know, the lack of uh, push from the defensive line. Um, the middle of the field, I didn't like the way they uh, stuck that. I mean, there were some improvements in that second half there. Shador Sanders looked uh, great. It looked great. Great start. Um, so, you know, shout out to the Colorado Buffaloes. I, I have uh, more conversations about that, you know, in due time. You know, as, as we get into the football season, both college and the pros. All right. Um, in W... NBA news uh, got a lot going on right now as usual so ESPN puts out uh, a ranking of the um, the rookies of the top rookies now before I go into what I think of the ranking the actual rankings themselves um, I think it's important to always remind ourselves the purpose of that ESPN serves. All right, ESPN is a sports media company. A sports media company. Uh, the purpose of sports media is to drive the interest of people into a particular sport. You know, to drive their interest. So this can be done through uh, making conversation, giving them things to talk about, giving them things to argue about. And for me, this is just, that's all this is. Um, their true feelings or, you know, whether or not, they, if you were to take a poll around the various ESPN uh, employees, who, writers, uh, staff members, etc., and ask them who they feel is um, you know the rookie of the year? I don't know that you would get the answers that this article uh, gave, right? I think it's put together the way it's put together in large part because they they want to spark conversation, and part of the way you spark conversation is you put together a list that you know will be controversial, that may go against the dominant opinion, that may go against the the popular narrative right so previous to this they had put out the top 24 rankings of all WNBA players right after the Olympics and uh, many people uh, like uh, many of the players like Kennedy Carter felt like she was uh, 
low on the on the list. And since then, we haven't really. I don't know. Kenny Carter to me hasn't been the same since. You know, um, I know uh, we're being told they were sick and so on. And okay, we'll we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Um, but this list here has uh, Angel Reese at one, Caitlin Clark at two. Three, I believe they went with, uh, what was it, Leah Edwards or Camilla Cardoso? But the controversial pick, of course, obviously was Angel Reese being number one. And, um, like I said, I don't know if they really believe that. Um, I think what they're looking at is the fact that Caitlin Clark has, uh, you know, a large rabbit fan base. And they know that that fan base is going to help drive interest. It's going to help drive ratings and so on. So the best way to stir them up is to imply that you believe Angel Reese is better. And I believe that's what's happening with this. Okay, for those who follow the channel, you know how I feel about Andrew Reese versus Caitlin Clark. Uh, so you can refer to some of those videos about my personal um, opinion on that matter. But um, this is what I think ESPN, as far as ESPN goes, I think that's all they're doing. Is is is, is that? Rakia Jackson, I think, came in either, in either fifth or sixth, which is crazy. Uh, Rakia Jackson, Jackson, for anyone who's been following. Uh, clearly believes Rakia should be three based on stats. Um, Rakia Jackson is one of the, the few, I think she may be the only rookie that's scoring you know, at a close to 50% from the field clip. It's around 46, 47 she's been there. She takes smart shots. Uh, she has a mid-range game. Uh, she has somewhat of a post game. She can shoot the, the long ball. You know, all of the things you want. She's just a classic three and uh from when I from the last few times I watched her I liked her her defensive fundamentals as well so I think she's clearly number three um not a lot of outrage about it because of the well number one I don't know I, I'm in Philadelphia I don't know uh, how the sparks are followed in LA and then of course you know just women's basketball in general is not um as popular as I think it will be at some point. So I think that's one of the reasons why there hasn't been that much outrage. But that's the main outrageous um, pick. Of course, what what's going to and what's happening right now in his video is more so about uh, Caitlin Clark fans being um, being outraged. And that's to be expected. They, they believe Caitlin Clark is um, uh, is in MVP discussions, right? They're still in that. They're mentally, that's the mental space they're in. So they believe, you know, rookie of the year is like, oh, yeah, you know, that's so far in the rear view. You know, Caitlin Clark is, uh, you know, she up there with Adrian Wilson, Nafisa Collier, and Stewie, and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, she way better than Jewel Lloyd and, and Kalia Copper and Sabrina Nescu and Kelsey Plum. And, oh, yeah, yeah she passed all of them. You know. The delusion of the uh, Caitlin Clark fans. Related to that is uh, recently, after the Connecticut Sun fell to the Fever, um, the the one win that the uh, Fever actually got over the Sun this year, you have one of their fans, one of the so-called Caitlin Clark fans. Put together a, um, I'm sure you, you saw it, a, a little Photoshop thing with uh, Caitlin Clark, like a like a police officer, looking down at uh, DJ A. Carrington, um, us laying under beneath a car, you know, uh, with her face superimposed on there, and um, this is the type of shit they think is funny, right? And this is why um, I continue to cook. Uh, Caitlin Clark fans. This is why I, I do cook Caitlin Clark's game. You know, I don't know her personally, though I am starting to wonder what type of person she is. You know, um, I do wonder a little bit. Um, but I, I'll say this. I, I'll say this. I think sports typically has a way of shaping people and framing them in a way to where 
they're more accepting accepting of uh, cultures, differences, um, religious differences, creeds, and, and all of these types of things. Um, you know, personally, when I played uh, football and played basketball and boxing, but more so football and basketball, those team sports, you know, I, I've, I've, I gained friends that were white guys, gained friends that were like, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans. Well, I grew up around Puerto Ricans anyway. That was never a thing. Puerto Ricans were always like allies where I am. You know, the part of North Philly I was growing up in, in, in it anyway. But the point is, I've been on teams with uh, white guys, Puerto Rican guys, uh, Asian guys, you know, um, Africans, people from the, so on and so forth. So I think at a young age, you learn to kind of and when you're young, you don't have those thoughts. You don't know the history of, um, you know, racism and race relations and the world wars. You don't you don't know anything about any of that. So you tend to just focus on sports and you become friends based on normal things like your personalities, uh, your similar interests, uh, all of those types of things, similar views, those types of things. And in my life, like even at my job, you know, um, there's white guys, there's black guys, primarily white and black guys at my job. And some of the white guys, you know, even managers, for example, I found among them, the ones who I'm most comfortable with, that we just naturally click are those managers of mine, the white guys, who actually like played sports, played basketball and football. And it's because they're more comfortable around being around black men and so on. And that playing those sports had a lot to do with it. You know, because they were already exposed to different cultures and people from a young age. So I think sports are good, you know, in that regard. They, they, they're definitely good in serving um, that type of purpose. Um, and this is kind of what I think. I I find it hard to believe that, like, see, someone like Caitlin Clark would be, you know, a racist in the in the um, in the general sense or in the uh, this the specific sense of you know a belief that white people are superior to black people. I don't think it's that sort of thing. When you play sports, you learn right away. <laughs> You damn sure ain't superior. You, you learn that. Um, I remember just growing up and uh, when I was running track, I remember, you know, white kids would learn early on, you know. Uh, oh, my God, you know, you know, the black guys are faster on the average. Okay. Um, you, we, we go, you go to sign up to, to play football, little league. The coaches, they already have in their mind the idea of what their running back is going to look like, their wide receiver is going to look like. We stand in the line and try out for different positions. He looks at me immediately and say, oh, yeah, go over there and try out for running back. Oh, yeah, go out there and try out for um, receiver. <laughs> See, he's a white guy. Oh, yeah, go try out for tight end. Hey, try out for fullback. Hey, you try out for uh, quarterback, right? So I, I, I think what happens, though, is – People like Caitlin Clark and others may be affected by stereotypes. That could happen. But I don't think she's like a uh, supremacist or anything like that. I just don't. I don't think so. You know, like, because de dealing with sports, like dealing with Aaliyah Boston, and them, that's going to kind of break that down, even if you had some of that. So I don't think that's the case. What I think happens with her is, she listens to advisors who have told her that they know what's best for her and this is how she should handle herself, you know, as what they're trying to build up to be a monarch athlete. And that, that's definitely what she is. She's a monarch athlete that, you know, big companies have put a lot of money in. And when they do do that, I mean, they make you sign these contracts and then these contracts are a number of different conditions. You have to speak a certain way to the camera. You, you you can't, you know, involve yourself in certain types of activities, at least publicly. You can't. There's a whole lot with those things. 
And I think that's kind of like what she's going under. And she, many of us think she should step up and say something about, uh, you know, this thing that, that many of these things that her fans are doing. And she's probably being advised, you know, to act as if she doesn't see it. Right? You're an athlete. Just focus on basketball. You know, take the Michael Jordan approach to things. Um, and with that, she's going to get scrutiny. And, you know, so we'll see how it all turns out. Um, I prefer athletes that kind of walk to the beat of their own drum to a certain degree, especially when it comes to, like, um, their self, their own personal self and their branding. Right, so I'll always prefer like the Allen Iversons, the Muhammad Ali's, you know, and those who, you know, will will speak up. Not when it's convenient, but no, will really speak up because they know that they're doing what's right, not because it's what they were um, advised to do, you know. But you know, that's that that that's that's just me. That's just the way I see that. Uh, so we got the Chicago Sky and the, the Fever coming up now. It's going to be a tough one. Uh, it's very winnable. I mean, the Fever are not an unbeatable team. And Chicago Sky, pretty much, no matter who they face, it seems like it's always coming down to the last second, primary for the most part. So I'm not going to say Chicago doesn't have a chance. Uh, but I'm also hearing, you know, everybody was sick and all this kind of stuff. And maybe I was a little too hard on the team and hard on Angel Reese last time because, you know, quote unquote, they were sick. Uh, I mean, I get it, you know, but let's not forget Chicago Sky actually had a lead. They had the game in hand when, you know, within three minutes left. You know, so that's why I kind of assumed uh, either they aren't that sick or uh, they were well enough to win. You know what I mean? But, you know, we'll go with the sickness thing. It's not a problem. So what you got to hope is they're all over the sickness uh, when they play the fever. But if I have to be honest, if you look at the way the fever is playing going into the game, look at the way Chicago is playing going into the game, Coupled with the fact that Chicago is not a dominant home team, which is so crazy to me. Not, they don't play very well at home. You look at their most impressive victories against Seattle, was in Seattle. Then they lose the Seattle game at home. Their impressive game over the Aces was in Las Vegas. And then they lose the game at home. So Chicago Sky are a very confusing team to me. <laughs> Try to figure them out. But those are my girls. I still root for them. You know, um... But if I was picking <laughs> with absolutely no bias and just going off of just basketball and who's on the streak right now, who's on a roll, you kind of tells you to pick the fever. You know, that's that's what that kind of tells you. But you never know, man. Uh, sometimes Angel Reese, she's one of those players with the type of will that can turn the tide. And I've seen it happen before, so I never. And then Kennedy Carter, you know, uh, Kennedy, yeah, she, you know, she's going to be up for that matchup against Caitlin. So you never know if those two players and then if Camilla, you know, can finally win her battle against Boston, you know, you got the two Gamecock uh, women. I love Gamecock matchups, man. Um, I love matchups be between Asia Wilson and Leah Boston. I love Leah Boston versus Camilla. So that's going to be fun. Uh, Dawn Staley sitting back proud, just giving the W all this talent, <laughs> you know. Um, that, that, that's what's up. To know that North Philly is inspiring the world, that that's a beautiful thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, let me go ahead and get, get back to work, man. Tell me what y'all think about those things. Uh, Deion Sanders, Buffalo, uh, you know, or Colorado, rather. Um, Kaylin and um, the, the rookie of the year race list from ESPN, um, as well as uh, what's the other thing I talked about? Yeah, Kaylin's fan base, the disgusting ass fan base. Um, yeah, so let me get on out of here, man. Peace out.